the American action painter uh, Robert Motherwell, abstract expressionist, who was the perhaps one of the main spokes uh, persons for the the painters uh, after the war in in America. Um, he talked about, in his case, it would be canvas. So you start actually with a white canvas. In this instance, you start. I'm starting with a white piece of paper. Now you work on this piece of paper, which is immaculate. But you try, you kind of dirty it really, and you try and take it full circle back to this perfect state. Of course, you never really managed to do that, but. Uh, that's, that's the kind of attempt. I suppose as a boy coming from Ayrshire and going to the art school in the 50s, uh, Glasgow was quite a strange, strange place for me. The art school was quite a daunting place, but I loved every moment of it there and couldn't wait for the, the summer holidays to finish, to go back. I've grown up with them all my life, so it, it, as his painting developed, I, I my understanding of his painting developed from sort of early days when he was painting like the H bomb explosions. His abstracts got better and better. I, I thought I can't actually remember a time that I didn't know Johnny Taylor really. Johnny and Jackie and I have been friends since the mid seventies, which is uh, forty years ago, unbelievably. And I think I really got to know Johnny best in about the mid seventies because. He was then involved in the print studio. Always a strong part of him is his walking, walking everywhere, unable to sit still. He's a restless kind of spirit. And that extends to walking about the city all the time where he lives. I think he was an artist's artist. You know, um, he, was, he had the most enormous respect from um, other painters. Um, of all persuasions, I mean, not everybody was an abstract expressionist, but that was what Johnny definitely was at that time. But he still always had this open mind. One of the things I've always liked about, about Johnny is that he's interested in a lot of things, not just painting. I mean, of course, painting, that's his passion, and that's been his life. Johnny did a, a, a series of, of crab apples, and uh, I decided for the benefit of this restaurant here to acquire all of them. The first one has got one crab apple, two crab apples, three crab apples, four, and then mysteriously five is missing. And my friend John insists that he never painted five. And I'm quite intrigued about that because I don't know where it is. And I've tried to persuade him that he should maybe do five, but he's not on the crab apple scenario just now. So maybe before it, things Eventually, if it finish, he might go back to crab apples and I'll get number five. Johnny was a natural choice uh, to do some work with us in collaboration on the lift enclosures and the glass balustrading. And uh, we soon sort of realised that Johnny had some pretty strong ideas about what he would want to represent within that environment. And behind me is an example of the kind of initial sketches. The work was uh, named Fragile. As, as we went through these initial uh, concepts, it was becoming clear there was a technological problem to solve as well, which Johnny, in his usual way, was totally up for that. So there was a number of visits to the glass manufacturer to establish how we might actually get these kind of markings on the glass. And anyone that's been there, and I'm assuming most people have done, you'd have seen, you know, quite a, an extensive work, uh, and that was just, you know, bags of energy were required to do that. Uh, and Johnny, as always, had bags of energy to do it. That precious thing which you can get from actually being yourself and being present in the landscape, whatever kind of landscape that is, is something that a lot of people are becoming increasingly detached from. So Johnny, I think, is a great antidote to that. <laughs> I'd like to think he is anyway because he, he's basically pulling his back to a particular place into a particular location and maybe asking us to reconsider what it is we think we see. Quite apart from the fact that the pictures themselves are quite frankly stunningly beautiful, a lot of them, um, is the value in them. At some point the work moved from being less 
overtly angst-ridden expressionism and it moved to something a bit quieter which eventually found its way into watercolour from oil. For me, watercolour is really the medium that he excels in. A lot of Johnny's work, I don't know what he would think about this, but it's reminiscent of people like Turner. There's a great feeling through the medium that he predominantly uses, which is watercolour, for light and space. And one of the, the very difficult things to do is to control the watercolour medium. And I think he does that exceptionally well. This picture here is down at the, near the science um, area down at the, at the Clyde. I think that's probably would be the BBC or STV um, television place now. Obviously this large kind of board which cuts right across, across the shape, which is an interest, makes for a very interesting abstract sort of form on the, on the image. Um, a lot of the pictures, um, the scenes no longer exist. Of course, like any city, it's, the horizon keeps changing and it's in a state of flux. This painting um, is up Stirrett Street um, in Mary Hill. The whole of this area, this is all gone now, and uh, I think there's new, new houses being built. It's very much a sort of dirty old town picture of Glasgow, strong black and white light. And way over in the, in the skyline is actually university. And these high-rise flats, I think that's the Wineford housing estate. So this is a moody, sort of gritty, urban painting, I suppose. Kind of dark and sombre, which Glasgow's light in a lot of them, um, kind of late autumn and early winter days. The image in this one, it's the King George V Bridge. And these were actually probably storage sheds, which at that time would be right down the whole of the River Clyde, which um, second city in the empire uh, produced probably more boats than any other city in the empire. I'm very excited about the retrospective because I feel that in my mind I'll have to be sewing together a lot of stuff that at first sight doesn't seem to be related. But of course it is because it comes from the same artist who's been working mostly here in Glasgow or based here in Glasgow all his life. Once there were roofs on these walls, men and women, children, voices, lambs stumble about in the sea fret, bleating, bleating, such sounds as are owned by the world. He was applying for membership to the Scottish Artists' Union and we had the form to fill in and there were about maybe nine or ten criteria that, that would ascertain whether you are eligible for membership or not. And you had to tick all these boxes. And he was able to tick all the boxes except one. And that was the one that said he was a member of learned uh, societies and uh, organisations and that he'd been recognised by them. And he's never been embraced by any of these institutions. So I was reminded of that very sharply when I saw this box being left unchecked. The story behind this one, um, when I was taking it to get photographed, is interesting. This is when I met Thatcher. And so I'm walking along the street, and next thing, motorbike riders, boom, 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 drive up in a big black limousine. The famous Margaret gets out in this blue two-piece sort of suit thing. And she walked up right to me when she got out of the car and says, uh, who are you? I says, I'm a painter. And I says, this is one of my pictures. And she says, can I see it? And I foolishly said, no. <laughs> but I don't think she would have liked the, the content too, too much anyway, especially when she, like a lot of politicians, are still totally involved in Trident and the continuation of such a nasty, nasty weapon which is redundant and is totally obsolete and is, is so morally unsound. But like Thatcher and Blair and the rest of them and the present crowd in power, it means we can sit at the top table. <laughs>